Hello, everyone. I think we'll get started. I think it's 4.30. <laughs> so thank you for coming to the annual Cudmore Lecture. As you know, it's always a very special event. And it's special for a number of reasons. And I can think of three reasons this time. As always, we have the Cudmore family here with us. And let me see, we have David and Donald, the two sons, and we have um, Brent and Annie and Mark, no, Paul, excuse me, I got it, Paul, um, the uh, three grandchildren, and Jean, Mrs. Jean Cudmore, uh, Paul, Dr. Paul Cudmore's wife. So it's just, it's lovely, it's just a special event. We just came from having tea, and, and because we drank our tea so quickly, we just, Tom took us, our dean took us on a tour of the zebra fish facilities so, in the last little while, so it's been really very nice. And as you know, this, this is such a special event in honor of Dr. Paul Cudmore, and you can read about him in the little brochure that you have, and just read that he was really uh, an innovator and ahead of his time, that he really believed in advancing medical education when people weren't we're barely thinking about it. And uh, so it's just such an honor to remember him. So do take a little bit of time to read about him. Okay, the second reason for it being so special is to welcome Dr. Case van der Gluten, who when you read the list of names, he was here 19 years ago as our Cudmore lecturer. And at that time, talking about assessment. And I think we'll hear that, that much has changed since then. And so, we're just you know, really looking forward to what he has to share. And we're looking forward to it as well as we've had a group, some of you may know that we've had a working group uh, since the fall looking at assessment. Uh, and there's a number of people in the audience who are part of that working group, working really hard, 7.30 meetings every second Monday morning, looking at assessment and looking at how we can improve. So we're really excited that Case is here and that will be the stimulus to help change a number of things that we think we're getting poised to change. I think my final comment is a personal one, because Case was my PhD supervisor at the uh, University of Maastricht. And, uh, and so I think that he, um, to say that he embodies from a, from a personal perspective every, everything that we would like to have embodied in a good assessor. He gives specific feedback, timely feedback, and in a very thoughtful way. One never feels dumb, which is really a nice thing. He asks really good questions that stimulate critical thinking. And so welcome, Case. I didn't say very much about you, did I? He, he's the, <laughs> I talked about everybody else. That's a, it's written up in the brochure. He's yeah, the, the director for the program in, uh, in research and development in the medicine, School of Medicine and Health Sciences and Life Sciences at Maastricht, and the, uh, the lead for the SHE, the School in Health, uh, Health Education, leads a master's and PhD program. And as you can see from the little CV, just recognized internationally and is really a leader internationally. So we're thrilled to have you with us and welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is a great honor to be back again. I mean, indeed, 19 years ago. And I remember so well because my youngest son was just born, really. And I wasn't very popular that back then for going to Canada. Um, you know, now he's, uh, he's two meters tall, uh, finishing his university degree this year, so things have changed to me too as well. Um, great opportunity to talk about assessment again, and that's what I'm going to do with you. And uh, basically, um, I think things have changed. And my talk way back when was also on assessment. But I think things have changed. And what I'm going to do is to take you on my personal journey. Um, my journey in my professional life, which is now more than 30 years in medical education and in developing and researching uh, assessment and many other areas as well. But today is the journey is on assessment. And what I'll do, um, there's a lot has been written and researched and developed in uh, assessment, and I'm going to summarize that research. Huh? From educational practice, I'm going to summarize the results 
uh, the messages that come from the research. And at least as I see that through my lens. And then from those messages from the research, we'll go to a bit of theory. Uh, talking about a model of assessment, which I think might be beneficial for the future. And then from there, we might give you an illustration, an example. So we move from theory to practice, and then we'll finish with a couple of conclusions. Okay? Our toolbox is extremely well filled in, in assessment of professional competence. We have a lot. And uh, this has all been developed in the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, and we've been climbing this pyramid. And anyone not familiar with this particular pyramid? Actually, it stems from the first Cutmore lecture, George Miller. And he published this pyramid as a very simple model of competence. Uh, so you have factual knowledge at the bottom. If you're able to apply that knowledge, you're able to uh, know how to use your knowledge, to reason with your knowledge. If you know, then know how to perform in a simulated session, uh, in a simulated setting, it's showing how. And then finally, in actual practice, it is the does level of assessment. And for each of these different layers, uh, different instruments have been produced. I'm not going into that, but you, mind you, we have a lot. We have a lot. If we talk, talk about work-based assessment, so assessment in the workplace or in postgraduate education, you might tilt the pyramid upside down, and we need to have as much assessment in the actual practice as possible. Um, for each of the measures that have been developed, you could look at that quality. You could look at the quality characteristics, and many of these characteristics have been proposed, and these are but five. Many of them, many more have been proposed. Um, for the sake of ease, I'm going to summarize the research on only three of these elements um, and um, infer some of the, the, the consistencies as I see them from the research. And I'll start with validity. What are we measuring? Uh, what are our measures measuring? What do we intend to measure? And if you then look at what we do in education nowadays, that has changed quite dramatically over the last number of years. And we used to have curricula which was basically defined by input. So many hours of anatomy, so many hours of physiology, so many hours of internal medicine, and that was a curriculum. Um, in postgraduate training, so much time in this particular workplace. Um, these were all time definitions. Nowadays, it's the opposite. We define the outcomes. We define what we want our learners to be able to do at the end of their training, which is a very different approach. And then, all depending on how well they learn, time is a variable, not a fixed thing. And we went from individual teachers defining what they thought was good for the curriculum to a more governed curriculum in which we plan things, right? We have, we teach something here because we want to go back to it over there. Curricula are planned, are governed, are evaluated, are changed, and that's a whole that's a big difference with, with the past. And we also emphasized different entities. In the past, we were very knowledge-oriented. Now, knowledge is very important, particularly medicine. But there's much more. And these are more generic competencies that uh, hold for any sort of professional. For example, you have to be a good communicator, or you have to be professionally behave yourself. And these competencies have become part of our training programs because they're pretty important. And I'll come back to that later on. And we changed from teacher-oriented programs to learner-centered programs in which we put the learning of the learner central to education. Um, sounds a bit paradoxical, uh, but it, it opposes to teacher-centered uh, uh, learning where the teacher defines what you're learning. Um, 
Nowadays, we put a lot more emphasis on self-directed learning as a basis for lifelong learning. Because that's what we have to do, ultimately. Okay. Um, what are we assessing? If you look at um, around in the world, you see these kind of outcomes being defined, competencies being defined across the world. And here are three very popular ones. But there are many more. There's a Saudi one. There's an Australian one. So there are many more of these competency frameworks. And what strikes me is that they're very similar, particularly if you start looking underneath. And these frameworks have been developed with a lot of stakeholder input. So apparently, and independently, with a lot of stakeholder input, we have, I think, quite some consensus of what we need to train for. Secondly, what I find really interesting is that we move beyond the knowledge domain. So we emphasize a lot of skills that move beyond the knowledge domain. There's good reason for doing that because um, later on, in actual practice, these kind of skills are essential. If things go wrong in clinical practice, these kind of skills are often evolved. We've done a study in which we looked at the hospital complaints in our hospital. 80% of the complaints are related to communication. Exactly, communication, right? Um, actually, there are studies indicating that if, th if you do really well on the labor market, it's these kind of skills that are involved. We have publications of cases that come to um, a, a professional court, in which are published in a medical journal, Dutch medical journal, every week. All kinds of, all these skills are involved, right? So uh, these are pretty important. There are studies showing that problems later on in clinical practice, in relation to these kind of skills, were already seen in the training program. So actually, you know, we have a responsibility to train and learn these kind of skills. What is also, I think, interesting about these competencies, these more generic competencies, they're not generic because they're always contextually bound, but you know, a lawyer has to communicate as well and behave professionally. In that sense, they're generic. Um, but these skills are very behavioral. They only can be demonstrated through behavior. Naturally, you can think of knowledge and communication and knowledge and professionalism, but showing that you can communicate and be a professional, that's what it's about. Now, these are very complex skills. They're not easy to define. Yet we all have a relationship with them. As a painter, if I were to hang up one of my paintings and Van, one of Van Gogh's, most of you would be able to pick out quickly which one is my sister, right? without you having a definition of what is good painting. Um, these kind of skills you don't learn overnight. You can't have a course on communication for a couple of weeks, have a sort of an exam at the end of the course, and then you're a good communicator for the rest of your life. It won't work that way. These kind of skills need to be developed longitudinally, over time, being nurtured, being given feedback on, being evaluated regularly, and be developed in a longitudinal fashion. Right, um, so that has a lot of implications for assessing, and we'll, we'll look at that. So the messages, really, if we look, if this is behavioral, if this is behavioral, then we have to rely on the top end of the pyramid, right? That has massive implications, because the lower three layers of the pyramid 
represent more or less standardized forms of assessment, like multiple choice exams, like um, OSCEs. The top end of the pyramid represents non-standardized assessment in the dirty world out there, right? And that's a challenge. Um, the standardized assessment is fairly established. Um, you know, there's an enormous amount. There's a whole OSCEology, for example, right, in terms of how to uh, assess clinical skills with OSCEs. Um, but the unstandardized assessment is really emerging, is interesting, is, is coming up. And we're starting to understand it, I think. And the messages that come from that validity research is that there's no single bullet that can do it all, right? There's not a single assessment method that can cover the entire competency pyramid. In order to do a good job, you need a multitude of different methods to cover the entire competency pyramid. And I remember that every time, maybe Dale, you, you also know, every time that we thought of something new, the key feature approach, uh, or the OSCE, or, um, you know, we thought of, now we have the holy grail in assessment. We never had it. We never had it. Um, you know, there's no magical bullet. What we also found is that um, in order to do a good job, you need both. You need both the standardized and the unstandardized assessment. Uh, um, and one complements the other. Then what we found, uh, very systematically really, if, if, you, if we talk about standardized assessment, that you can do a good job in terms of its quality by developing materials carefully. If you take an objective structure clinical exam, an OSCE, you can train your assessors, you can train simulated patients, you can select a, a standard setting method, you can write your scenarios, review your scenarios, you can do a lot. You can, you can sharpen the instrument before you start assessing, right? And if you do a good job on that in terms of quality control, your instrument will be okay. In a lot of practices, we don't do that, and we're not okay, and our assessments are pretty poor. Nevertheless, you can make them really sharp before test administration. In non-standardized assessment, the instrument is not so important, less important, but the people are important using the instrument. The way they take the interaction the feedback, seriously, is really determining the utility of non-standardized assessment. Simple tick boxes hardly have any information value, won't really help. So it's really in the people where your concern is, and that is also a headache, because you ha now not have to sharpen the instrument, but you have to sharpen the people, which is a challenge, a big challenge. Right, so these are the messages uh, from, from validity research, some of the major messages. Let's look at reliability. Reliability is the reproducibility of the findings that I have with my instrument. Um, if I were to measure your length, and I would do it twice, I would expect a high relationship between the first and the second measure. That is consistency, that is reliability, that's called reproducibility. We can estimate that for our assessment instruments, and we've done so. Many studies have been published in the literature. And let me give you an overview. Um, basically from the left, um, we're low in Miller's pyramid, and we move up to the right. Multiple choice, short essays, patient management problem, which was meant for assessing clinical reasoning. You gave simulated encounters on paper, uh, simulated problems, and um, the responses were being scored. Oral exam, very subjective. The long case in the British tradition, uh, you have a patient, and then afterwards you have an oral on that particular patient. Uh, the OSCE, the Objective Structured Clinical Examination. 
the mini CEX where you look in, where you observe an actual practice and you sit down with the learner and give that learner feedback. Uh, the practice video assessment where we have a video uh, recording encounters in actual practice and then we select encounters and score them. And finally, in cognitive simulated patients, standardized patients, these are fake patients that we sent out to doctors' practices, um, incognito uh, patients. The doctors were not aware that they were visited by a fake patient, really. We had ethical consent. <laughs> and we sent letters to the physicians saying they're going to be visited by a simulated patient in the next coming half year. And we gave them forms so that when they thought they had detected a simulated patient, they could fax us. And we got the forms, but not with the simulated patients. Um, but actually, this is very unobtrusive assessment. There's no stage effect. The person being assessed is not aware that he or she is being assessed. Right. Then you can calculate reliability, and I won't go into the technique of that. Um, and they say that you need a reliability for at least 0.80 in order to do a good job, particularly in a summative context. So reliability of 0.80 is minimum. Then the reliabilities have been standardized for time so that you can compare across different methods of assessment. So what do you see? What's your conclusion? You need pretty long testing time. You need quite some testing time in order to come up with a reliable score. What's behind this is that any performance measured by any method, doesn't really matter, is highly variable, all depending on the context. So if you change contexts, you get different performance. And this has been called the content specificity of clinical expertise. Uh, and it's been not, not only been found in medicine, it's been found anywhere. So the variability of the performance across different items, essays, OSCE stations, um, really determines a lot of noise in the measurement. Therefore, you have to sample widely across items, orals, stations, in order to do a good job. So this is bad news. Most of our tests in actual practice are simply unreliable. Or yet in other words, we take a lot of false positive and false negative decisions simply because of measurement error. Um, so basically, one measure is no measure. Um, so that is really bad news. But there's also good news in this slide. The good news is there's not much difference between methods, you know. And that's interesting because more objectified methods do just as well as more subjective methods, right? So objectivity is not the same as reliability. You can have very unreliable assessment with objective testing, and you can have very reliable testing with subjective assessments, provided that you sample widely. So many subjective judgments make up a pretty reliable inference. And that is good news. Remember these hard to define competencies? In order to assess them, we need some form of professional judgment. We need some form of holistic judgment. Yes, that's more subjective. And the point is, so what? you can have many subjective judgments and you'll still come up with a pretty reliable inference, okay? So that's really good news because all these competencies, these generic competencies can only be assessed with professional judgment. 
And over the many years, I think that um, we've been removing professional judgment from the assessment scene. Right? Let me give you an example. Orals were considered to be very subjective. Long cases, very subjective. And these were the standard assessment tools for assessing um, clinical performance in the old days. And because of their subjectivity, the OSCE was propo proposed and got very popular. I mean, there's not a single medical school around the world not using OSCEs nowadays. And Harden, who proposed the OSCE, look at the term, objective, structured, clinical examination. Now, many years later, we know it's not in the objectification, nor in the standardization that brings you measurement information, but in the sampling. And luckily, I got my hands on very subjective exams, like the long case and the oral exam. And they show reasonable, or just as poor, all the way uh, how you look at it, glasses are half full or half empty. Um, whether, you know, there's not a single instrument that is inherently better because it's more objectified, which I think is great news. We uh, developed an electronic portfolio and we're sitting on a lot of data um, from postgraduate uh, training. And um, here's um, the reliability expressed as a number of samples. Um, in this case, from the mini CEX, and this is assessment of technical skills. This is multi-source feedback. And basically, what it says, there's a magical number of eight. Sort of, if you have a sample of eight, you'll do pretty well, okay? And that's a pretty feasible sample, right? And if he were to judge me, and he's very hawkish, uh, and, and, and she judges me, she's uh, lenient. And he's hawkish, hawkish, lenient, lenient. And that will nicely average out across the sample, bringing a good inference. Right, and actually, if you combine those methods, you even need smaller samples. So if you combine information, your sampling even becomes less. Right. So some of the messages, yes, acceptable reliability is only achieved if you sample widely across contexts at least, but also across cases and assessors or any other uh, um, factor that influence your measurement. No method is inherently better. Anyone may go, whether old, whether new, doesn't really matter. Objectivity is not the same as reliability, which is a phenomenal insight, I think. And many subjective judgments form a pretty robust picture. Clear? Okay. Then let's look at learning impact. Um, they always say that assessment drives learning. Learners will do anything to do well on the assessment. For learners, the assessment, the exams, really represent the curriculum. And, you know, the learners will do whatever you want them to do. If you want them to memorize things, they'll memorize things. If you want them to learn checklists by heart because you're assessing them on checklists since OSCE stations. They will learn checklists by heart. They will do anything. And like anyone now, we are a homo economicus. We wish to have maximum effect with the least of effort. But the relationship is complex. There's a lot of negative effect of the assessment on learning. You know. Learners hunting for grades, um, creating a great culture, a competitive culture, instead of a cooperative culture. I see a lot of reductionism in assessment. Let me give you an example of my own training program. I was trained in a semester system. At the end of the semester, we had a bunch of exams. Um, in the beginning of the semester, I did nothing. I partied. 
and met my wife. <laughs> which, was, which was beneficial because the exams required little more than reproduction, regurgitation of factual knowledge. I'm describing your training program as well. Um, I naturally am a boy, so I procrastinated too long. And then I worked my butt off to prepare for the exam, many hours per day. I went to the exam. I couldn't do all of them properly, so I scouted the number of them. I mostly passed. Never. I only failed one exam. I had a good memory in that time. Um, you know, I only failed once. When I, when I finished the exam, I wiped out my hard disk entirely to move on to the next exam. And I see all you nodding and, 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 and recognizing this, this learning style. Well, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the forget curves in psychology. But after two weeks, 50% is gone, and it will go down even to 25 30%. So there's a lot of reductionism. Uh, I think in, and the, the standard model of assessment is that you have a course and at the end of the course you have an exam and you know it's kind of the art of throwing away information because you, you have a standard, um, you pass or you fail, you don't know what the performance is behind it, you pass or fail. Um, if, you've, if, if you pass, you're sort of immune for life because you get your credit points. <clears throat> That's water under the bridge. Move on to the next one. If you fail, we take a silly measure. We don't look at what the problem is. We simply say, retake the test. And if you then retake the test and you would fail again, we don't look at the problem. We simply say, repeat the course. Uh, so we, we kind of blindly use our um, information system. Or you get a grade. Well, let me tell you, the poorest form of feedback is a grade. If you were to grade me on a 10-point scale, you'll give me a 7. Fine. What should I do next? Yeah, get an 8. But how? <laughs> so, you know, um, Particularly if we talk about complex skills, grades don't have any information value. Um, so I see a lot of reductionism. Uh, with this whole osceology all over the world, I see a lot of monkeys doing tricks, not really knowing what they're doing, simply passing the test. Um, and I see few longitudinal elements. And we were talking about the longitudinal development of skills. I see very few longitudinal evaluation systems. It's all block, end of block, finish up, block, so on and so forth. And I think this doesn't belong, that kind of a view on assessment aligns with an outdated model of learning, which is mastery learning, right? which is very behavioristic. Once you've learned it, you, you sort of staple everything on top of each other. And it's um, the responsibility of the learner to integrate that and to be able to use that information when confronted with professional tasks. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. In order to learn properly, you know, we construct our own world um, and we, we do that much more with, with, with self-directed learning. Um, and that's a very different model. That's a more constructivistic model on learning. You're using PBL. PBL is a constructivistic approach to, to learning. Yet probably you still have a behavioristic system of assessment. You know, I never understood that you can tell students Go and self-direct yourself and define your learning objectives. But here at the end of the course, you have to jump th through this hoop. That's conceptually not clear to me. Right, so we need to have a different model of assessment 
that better aligns with our modern view on learning. So I would say that the messages that come from the learning um, research on assessment, that we should have feedback in the system, information in the system. So no assessment without feedback, in my view. But we've learned a lot, particularly for complex skills, quantitative information is not so useful. And we have a fantastic tool, namely language. Let's use it. Narrative information carries a lot of weight and has a lot of impact. And then we've understood, partly also through the research of Joan, that uh, feedback, giving feedback alone is not sufficient. A lot of the feedback is simply, you know, ignored by learners, particularly in summative settings. So if in a summative setting, a learner passes a test, doesn't care about feedback. So what's the point? Uh, so feedback really should be a dialogue, a two-way process, a process which is supported, which is scaffolded, which is um, which is followed up upon. So the dialogue is really important. And then we need longitudinal assessment much more than we than we use than we currently do. So these, to me, are the messages from the three. Um, characteristics that we could look at instruments. And with that in mind, we may shift back and think more theoretically with these messages behind us. I mean, I think what I've just demonstrated to you, that from any angle, any individual assessment has severe limitations. And that Every individual assessment severely compromises on any of these quality criteria. You will never have a perfectly reliable test. You will never have a perfectly valid test. You know, um, it's only through different tests and different assessments that you can cover the whole. And to me, the implications from the reliability research is you need to have many different assessments. The validity research says you need a multitude of different methods. The learning impact research says we need to have information, meaningful information for the learner. And to me, that's the basis for programmatic assessment. Um, and the curriculum, I think, is a good metaphor. I was, I was, in the beginning, I told you, modern curricula are governed, you know, are planned, are evaluated. Um, and I would suggest the same for assessment, where you do things deliberately. You want the learners to present here, to analyze there, to orally defend there, to write over there, and so on and so forth. Um, and you use any sort of method. I don't care. I'm agnostic in relation to method of assessment. It all depends how you use it and what your educational justification is for that method at that particular moment in time. But the question is, how do you do that? How do you then do that? The literature is only about individual methods of assessment, and it's particularly reliability and validity aspects. So we started uh, with um, a, 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 a guy, Joost Dijkstra, formulating a set of um, guidelines that are out there. A bit too much, I think. 73 is a lot. Um, you may also know Amy. They have um, an in initiative called Aspire, in which schools can have um, an extra qualification in certain areas. Assessment is one, and they've published nice criteria on the assessment program as a whole. But I take a more theoretical perspective. Um, to me, every assessment is but one data point. Right, the little triangle, Miller's triangle, but one data point. Any individual assessment is looking at an individual through a keyhole through the door, right? And 
in my view, every individual assessment, every data point should be optimized for learning, should be meaningful for learning, should therefore have feedback to the learner, right? And it should be variable, it should be, it should vary in, in format, all depending on the educational justification for using that method at that particular moment in time. And I would replace the summative formative debate by a continuum of stakes. What is at stake here? Low stake decision or no decision or a high stake decision. And I think the number of data points should be proportionally related to the stake of the decision, right? Uh, if there's a low stake decision, doesn't really matter. Huh? Uh, you can use a single data point. If you have a very heavy high stake decision, you need a lot of data points. To make it more concrete, um, low stake, one single data point is geared, optimized for learning, meaningful for learning, giving feedback, right? It's not decision oriented. You do not pass or fail. You simply give information, tough. Because if you tell your teachers, um, you cannot fail your students anymore. Your role is not to pass or to fail. Your role is to provide information. The decision will be taken elsewhere when we have a lot more information. If we have more information, we may have intermediate decisions. Intermediate decisions where you diagnose the learner. What's going on? What are your strengths? What are areas for remediation? Now, remediation is very different from the classical retake exam. Remediation is personalized. Uh, remediation is, is done with the learner um, himself and very individualized. Um, if there's a, a high stake decision, for example, at the end of the year uh, for promotion to the next year or maybe even certification, you need a lot of data points. But if you have a lot of data points with rich information, you can have a good picture of an individual. So you can also look at this. Each individual assessment is but a pixel, right? And if you have a single pixel, you won't see a lot, right? If you have more pixels, you see more. Any idea? Ah, the Mona Lisa, he got it, he got it. <laughs> the, yeah. yeah, good, very good, very good. So you're building a picture of a learner. You use information, you diagnose, you remediate. You use the information to learn um, and at the same time to take decisions. One final point I'm going to make, uh, that is in the classical approach, we tend to aggregate information within a method, within methods, right? And then we have multiple methods and we then aggregate that information again. Um, it, let's take an OSCE, where you have a station on history taking and communication, and then the next station is on resuscitation. And then you have a bunch of other stations and you aggregate the information across all stations into a final outcome. Now, I don't know what resuscitation and history taking have in common. Probably nothing. But we simply add it up because it's part of the OSCE. And I think we can much more meaningfully aggregate across skills. So I would be in favor to aggregate the information in a station on communication with information on a multi-source feedback on communication, which is a much more meaningful way of aggregating information. 
So these competencies frameworks are pretty handy for that because you can structure your assessments in relation to these competencies and more meaningfully aggregate information. Now, I could go on for a long time, um, put this into the literature with a model which explains things a lot more deeper um, and more detailed, but I won't go into much more details. And recently, I, I, I published the 12 tips paper in Medical Teacher. Um, but you know, this is still, this is still theory. And I think I better give you an example of how this may work in actual practice. And there are a bunch of examples now out there using programmatic assessment. And actually, I must add one to the list as of today, because I heard from Tom that their program in family practice and general practice is completely, utterly, extremely um, programmatic. And I think with great success. Um, they don't do anything quantitatively anymore. They do everything qualitatively. And that's interesting because assessment is often associated with quantification, with scores. They only deal with information, with narrative information. So we move from a world in assessment from scores to a world of words, which is a very interesting, very paradigmatic <coughs> change in assessment. I also came across um, a paper just recently from McMaster's, um, from the emergency medicine doctors there, and they also use programmatic assessment, and I was impressed. Um, forgive me, I'm going to stay home as much as possible because I know that program best. I'm going to talk about our graduate entry program in medicine in Maastricht. In Maastricht, we have two medical programs. One is a six-year undergraduate medical program, three years bachelor's, three years of master, um, fully problem-based, 340 students per year. Um, and we have a graduate entry program in medicine where people have a relevant bachelor or master degree before they enter medicine. And they do they have a shortened version of it, four years. And on top of that, they uh, do a lot of research and they get a Master of Science in Research. That's a very full program. Um, it's focused on excellence. You know, we want only excellence. We have very high expectations of the students. Also, a, very, a PBL curriculum. Uh, the PBL in the first year is based on pa paper patients, simulated patients in the skills lab. In the second year, the PBL starts with a patient, a real patient, which they see in an outpatient clinic. So um, the actual stimulus for learning is a real patient in the second year. Then clerkship rotations. And then half a year of research and half a year of uh, um, a clerkship in one of their, um, the, the, whatever they like. And that may be connected. So the research and the clerkship rotation may be connected to each other. Uh, the assessment program is that we do a, a module assessment, uh, like anyone would do. Um, but there's a lot of variation. We might also have very mini assessments across one problem, giving a feedback on this particular problem. Um, we might have presentations. We have um, um, assignments which are being evaluated. So they're very variable. We also have a lot of longitudinal assessment. Um, for example, we do a lot of peer assessment on, on uh, the competencies. Um, peer assessment and tutor assessments, um, which is very qualitative. Uh, I mean, very narrative. We use a lot of words instead of scores. Um, we also have progress tests, which is uh, a multiple choice test. But well, that's a multiple choice test that is sort of a final examination through all the disciplines of the curriculum. And that is being held every three months and given to all the students in the curriculum. So when a student comes in first year, 
His first final examination is given in the first week of his training program. That learner won't be able to answer many questions, the second year a little bit more, and so on and so forth. And you can't prepare for progress tests, because what would you prepare, right? Anything could be asked. So you simply do your work in the tutorial groups, and you'll find yourself growing automatically, kind of. You don't need to cram, you don't need to be anxious, you'll grow automatically towards a higher level. And also it's focused on functional knowledge. I mean, if you learn your anatomy in the first two years, you still have to answer anatomy questions at the end of your training. We do a lot of peer assessment again on professional behavior and other competencies. And all the assessment is informative and low stake. You cannot fail a single assessment. Okay? The portfolio is the central instrument. Um, and the portfolio to me is the learner chart, very comparable to a patient chart, where all the information is being gathered and in which um, the learner reflects on his development and discusses that with someone else. This is what it looks like in a graph. Um, also very important to say is that each of the learners will have a mentor that will follow that learner throughout all four years. We call them counselors, I hate that term, um, but they're coaches, they're mentors. Um, and they have a very intimate relationship with the learners. They are the dialogue that is created around the assessment. Uh, learners reflect, remediate, discuss that, everything with their mentor, the mentor follows uh, up on them. At the end of the year, there's a meeting where final decisions are being made and a summit of decisions being made. A high stake decision is being made. I should formulate it in a different way. We put in a lot of effort in terms of giving feedback. Here's a, um, an example of um, um, progress test information. You can go online and look at your total scores longitudinally across time. This student is not too good in the beginning and has seen the light probably in the third year and started to perform better. And then actually the last part, the open part, you'll see the computer projecting future results based on your past results. And you can do this for your total scores, you can do this for your anatomy scores, you can do that for your total basic science scores um, for any sort of query that you might have. And you compare that to the performance to the whole cohort. And in the Netherlands, we collaboratively do this kind of testing with five out of the eight medical schools collaboratively. So you can also compare you every three months to a national average. We also provide um, good information on um, the competencies. We have adopted in the Netherlands the CanMeds competencies, your competencies, and they are actually part of law, so every curriculum has to map its curriculum to the CanMeds competencies. We assemble information from different sources and different instruments, and we aggregate that into the competencies, and here's an overall chart, the spider chart in which you can see individual performance related to cohort performance. So they can compare. They see where they are. If you look at work-based assessments, they're into the system, and you can um, see this, these assessments in time. You can click on each of the dots, and you will get all the quantitative, but also all the qualitative information in relation to that particular moment of assessment. So you have a very rich database on the learner. Quantitative, qualitative. And then I cannot stress sufficiently how important the mentors are. Extremely important. Um, and these mentors are just regular teachers. It's a regular teaching role. And it's actually very much valued 
uh, because you have a very direct relationship with learners. So this is a gratifying teaching role. And then the decision making is done by a committee. So ultimately a committee will take a decision. In that committee, the, the, the mentor will not have a role because we wish to protect the relationship between mentor and mentee, right? And you can't be a judge and a helper at the same time. The work of the committee, it sounds like an awful amount of work, but it isn't because, you know, 95, 98% of the cases are straightforward. You know, they do well. And it's only on a few percent of the cases that they really have to deliberate, right? And think long and maybe even gather additional information before they come to a decision. You think that's subjective? Yes. It is another professional judgment, which is required because you have quantitative information, qualitative information. You can't average qualitative information, it requires another professional judgment. Then how do you know it's not biased? Well, we take all kinds of measures so that that judgment isn't biased. Procedural measures, let me, let me be more clear. For example, the size of the committee will matter, a larger size will, uh, will matter in terms of the credibility of the decision that will come from that. The amount of deliberation will matter, will build to the trustworthiness of the decision. The fact that the outcome and prior feedback cycles, the outcome of the committee's decision is no surprise to the learner, builds to the credibility of the decision. The fact that you can justify your judgment builds to the credibility of the decision. The fact that you can appeal on the committee justifies and builds to the credibility of the decision. And this is basically based on, inspired on methodologies that we use to make qualitative research more robust. So we use qualitative strategies to remove as much bias from the decision as possible but we don't replace the professional judgment. Imagine you're a GP. Imagine that we would take away his professional judgment from his practice. That will be, that will be impossible. You know, he couldn't, wouldn't be able to do his work. Is his judgment biased? Yes, it is. That's why we have guidelines and support systems and second opinions, but we don't take away your professional judgment. And I think we should do the same in assessment. And I think we have been removing professional judgment all for the wrong reasons in education. Often the whole assessment business is um, has a very strong assess uh, psychometric discourse, which is all about standardizing and removing bias. And I think that we have thrown away the baby with the bathwater, and we need that professional judgment back into the system. Right, just to brag, if we compare the performance of our graduate entry programs with our undergraduate students, and then look at the last four years of the six-year program and compare uh, across the two training programs, then the graduate entry program students start lower than the six-year undergraduate students. But they end up very high at the end. And actually, this doesn't look like a big difference, but it's an effect size on the scoring scale, which is substantial. And I've never seen that before. Naturally, causality is a problem, I can't say this is because of programmatic assessment. Uh, many variables uh, probably behind this, but at least, as you see, programmatic assessment may work, may work well. Right, naturally, the next stage, 
problem is to go back to research, right? And see how things function in programs that have used programmatic assessment and understanding why things function or not function and then readjust the model again. It's sort of an iteration between practice and research, which is called design-based research, uh, which I think is important. And first, studies are coming out. Um, time doesn't per permit me to go into that. Let me come to some conclusions. I think we have to stop thinking in terms of individual assessment methods, right? We need a systematic approach, a more, um, a more educationally oriented approach that is longitudinally oriented um, in our education programs. Every method is functional. Let me give an example. Our students like oral exams because, you know, they have agency on the exam. They can show what they can do. They like oral exams. Professional judgment is absolutely essential. Otherwise, we can never make it really relevant. And subjectivity is dealt with through sampling, as I showed you earlier, or through all kinds of professional or uh, procedural bias reduction measures that deals with that bias. But we don't remove the professional judgment. And I think that programmatic assessment, therefore, optimizes both the learning function of assessment as well as the decision-making function of assessment. And I think that is an integrated whole that fits. That is fit for purpose. And that is the end of my journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm not sure that we have time for, for formal questions, but does anyone have a, a, burning, a burning question? I invite you to a reception afterwards where certainly you can uh, talk with Case individually. Any question that is burning on the tip of anyone's tongue? No, they don't dare. <laughs> yes, Diane, can you hit your, hit your button? It's, it's kind of a, I mean, it's, it's more talking about back to the people that you're talking about. It depends on who's working and who's doing these things. So um, do you have a sense of, uh, maybe, it's maybe the generational kind of question. So the people who are now putting the programmatic assessment in may have been trained in a certain methodology, and now you're enacting a completely different one. And so in any of this, how do you account for, well, we learned it this way, but I, we think it's a, diff, it's a better way, and, and has there been application of, well, they learned it differently, but now the outcomes are, are the same or different? I, it was just kind of curious in terms of... Well, you know, this, the, the, moving towards programmatic assessment reminds me of moving towards PBL. Huh? And I, I, you know, I've been in that business for many years, and um, the same arguments hold there. Uh, you know, when we, we don't know what PBL is and what it may do and whether it's beneficial and, and our learners are not used to that and when they come in, you know, they don't understand that. And it has been a struggle to convince people because this is about convincing people mm -hmm. and not about the methodologies there, but, you know, it's, it's, it's about convincing. It's a shift in thinking. It's a mindset change and that's difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. Um, but that doesn't discharge us of, of trying to do it. And I actually never worry about learners. You know, uh, in medicine, we get the cream de la cream anyway. They'll do fine despite our education. <laughs> and um, so I think, and I never worry about learners. They're very flexible. They're adaptive. I never, ever worry about learners. I worry about teachers. Mm. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's, 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 it's getting a new behavior repertoire. And that's not easy. And I think teachers learn in exactly the same way as students do, by experience. And um, so simply telling them won't do it. Mm. They have to experience it. We did a course on programmatic assessment a couple of weeks ago. 
And uh, in the first day, we had our um, people coming to the course interview the undergraduate students and interview the graduate entry students. They were convinced. You know, they were completely convinced. The graduate entry students are feedback students. They, they want to know. And they look for it. And they're on top of it. They're on top of their learning. And that convinced them. So I, I should have, we should have given the compliment to a group of students who, who sh I should have brought. That would have convinced you a lot more than my fancy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. So I was going to invite Dale Daphne just to say uh, a couple of words. You can see that Dale uh, was uh, one of the first uh, lectures in the Cudmore series. Would you like to? Yes, do you want to just yeah, do it there if you'd like? Thank you, Joan. It, uh, it was many years ago. Uh, I had different color hair, and I had hair. <laughs> Case, I've known you for many, many years and had the pleasure of working with you, some interesting collaboration in many places. We all have come to respect that Maastricht is a special place. It's, a relative, it's an old school, but a relatively new university, and they are amongst the top 40 in the world now, amongst the new universities for many reasons. Uh, you've shown us the way in so many things. You've had so many wonderful colleagues, some of your own tutors, who've helped us, redirected us. And you personally have met a lot to many people in this room. But again, I've never ever heard you come where you didn't make me think very carefully about everything I do and think about. And in this era of social accountability and responsibilities, this has been a terrific way to stimulate all of us as teachers to move things ahead. Thank you so much again. Thank, thank you. So please join us, if you can, for the reception outside. And Case is offering a workshop tomorrow and as part of the Education Institute on Thursday. So hope to see some of you there. <laughs>